Good morning, friends. I suppose it's actually quickly tipped over the noon hour, so now it's technically afternoon in Salt Lake City. Uh, welcome to the fourth and final installment of the Pathways to Inclusion series that the CLE Department and UCLE are co-hosting for the 2023 calendar year. We are so thrilled for the environment that all of you have created, as well as for the opportunities that you've you've given us to have our community lean in for these conversations. We've really seen an explosion of interest and conversation throughout our legal community. You can see several of our sponsors listed on the slide there for you. Today's session is specifically sponsored by Rocky Mountain Advisory. Um, they are the most recent sponsor to come forward for Euclid. They are a forensic accounting firm um, here in Salt Lake City, and they do a bit of work for Euclid, um, giving in-kind donations as well as services. In addition, in our wider community, they do forensic accounting, bankruptcy, and restructuring. Um, business turnaround and dispute analysis and receivership work for um, all different kinds of clients and businesses. And we just want to acknowledge their contribution to this CLE series. We've had a number of sponsors throughout the time that we've been hosting these four series, Ray Quinney and Nebaker, Buckalter, um, as well as FF SF firm have all been contributing to our ability to provide this CLE series and this continuing conversation. The good news is that Euclid and the CLE department are going to partner again in 2024 and offer a new CLE series continuing this conversation about inclusion in our workplaces and inclusion in our legal community. We find it to be a remarkably important subject. And in particular, I want to pay particular respect to our panelists this morning, this afternoon. Um, all of you have given time and energy and support to this conversation, as well as to helping certify firms throughout the local community um, for Euclid. And I just want to appreciate your leadership in leaning in and stepping forward as panelists today and Melinda stepping forward as our moderator to help our community continue to have wide conversation, ranging conversation, and meaningful opportunities for dialogue to share not only like-minded points of view, but really ranging and disparate points of view, because we were alluding earlier in our conversation, we celebrate the idea that we might disagree. Uh, we love the chance to listen and hear from each other, and even to be a bit rowdy about it. We're friends and a chosen family, so we can do that around the table and still be respectful and thoughtful with each other. But to have a bit of meaning and a bit of value, particularly as we end a calendar year and look toward goals for next year, we just are really thankful for Euclid's presence in our legal community in the stewardship of our panel and our moderator. So Melinda, I'll, I'll turn the time to you formally and you can introduce your panelists and, and begin our discussion. And we just wanna thank those who are in attendance with us this afternoon. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle, um, for recognizing our sponsors and for introducing the topic that we have here today. Um, these topics are near and dear to my heart. And um, I think for all of our panelists as well, and I'm, I'm sure that since you're here, you also have some sense of concern and care for what we are gonna talk about. But um, I wanna start us off just by recognizing that inclusion and well-being is also um, captured within our Utah Rules of Professional Conduct. And specifically in Rule 1.1 and Comment 9, we learn that um, as part of our duty to be competent in our representation of clients, we also should be aware that our mental, emotional, and physical well-being may impact our ability to represent clients. And as such, it's an important aspect of maintaining competence to practice law and compliance with the standards of professionalism and civility. And then the rule goes on to state that resources supporting lawyer well-being are available through the Utah State Bar. And we hope that this is one of those resources that we can come together and talk about how inclusion promotes well-being and how they really go hand in hand and how we can each contribute to a more inclusive um, workplace where we are individually, but also at an institutional level, what can be done to foster inclusive environments. And so with that, I want to um, begin the discussion with our panelists and I'm actually going to allow each of them to introduce themselves. And then I want them each to start us off by explaining what inclusion means to each of them specifically. So we have some 
context and framework that we're going to be working from. So I'm going to start, um, I'm just going to let them go in the following order. I'm going alphabetically. So Cherise okay. by first name, Cherise, and then Izzy, Kasinga, Grace Acosta, and Kenneth Sharperson. We're so excited to hear from each one of you today and to have a conversation. So um, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourselves. Thank you, Melinda. My name is Sharice Bukolsky. I'm a partner at the Appellate Group. Um, we are an all-female law firm here in the Salt Lake City area. Um, we didn't do that on purpose. It just kind of happened that way um, because of the students who um, volunteered to work for us. Um, when we first started out, they went on to do clerkships and then applied to work with us afterward. And then we We've had references from judges and they all happen to be female um, and all happen to be amazingly qualified and brilliant, brilliant attorneys. And so we just kind of hit the jackpot by um, welcoming so many amazing women into our firm. Um, right now we are nine strong and we couldn't be more thrilled to have the nine women that we have. We are of course open to hiring um, men in the future. Uh, if we ever put a uh, an ad out for hiring. Of course, it won't say anything about <laughs> whether you have to be a man, woman, or something in between. It'll just, you know, we're open to to whomever would would like to come join us in our firm. Um, but anyway, that's that's a little bit about me. Um, and I just I love working um, with the women that I work with. They're just such amazing and smart women. Um, Melinda, did you want us to do introductions first and then go into what is inclusion? Yes, that's great. Oh, are you going to talk about inclusion? Sorry, Sharice. <laughs> okay. My name is Izzy Kasang. I'm an associate at uh, a law firm here in Salt Lake. Uh, it's Strindberg, Skolnick, Birch, Hallam, Harstead, Thorne. We practice predominantly plaintiff's employment law. Um, and then I will pass it to Grace and then go ahead. Hi, I'm Grace Acosta. I am one of the co-owners of Trujillo Acosta Law. Um, we are an entirely bilingual firm here in the state of Utah. We are the biggest um, minority owned firm in the state. Everyone in our firm from the receptionist all the way down to every lawyer is bilingual in one language, mainly Spanish. I just hired one paralegal who does not speak Spanish, but she says that she's learning. Like she has all those apps on her phone. That's the only person that everyone else speaks Spanish because we recognize that there was such a big need in our community to service the Hispanic community. So we are trying to provide premier AV rated um, legal representation to a community that has been histi historically underserved. Um, I'm a past president of UMBA. I've been on the Bar Commission. I love Euclid. I was on there. Um, um, committees for years, and I'm just so happy to be here to help share some insight that I've experienced and learned over the years. Uh, good morning. My name is Kenneth Sharperson. I am the Chief Diversity Officer at Armstrong Teasdale. Um, we are uh, a national uh, law firm. We have 18 offices, but we have an office on uh, Main Street um, in Salt Lake City, um, and I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, prior to this role, I did serve our uh, 20 years um, as a litigator, um, litigating, you know, complex uh, insurance coverage disputes um, and some other just general commercial uh, disputes. Um, I've also uh, chaired um, a diversity committee for the uh, New Jersey State Bar Association um, for about six years. And, you know, just throughout my career, the firm served um, and chaired different uh, diversity committees for law firms. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about the uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourselves. I hope um, it's at least somewhat evident to all of the people that are here that we really tried to be intentional about identifying our panelists today. They come from a wide range of um, types of organizations for which they work or which they own, um, a wide variety of lengths of you know years of experience, and just different perspectives that we hope can be useful to the whole group here and hope that you can take away something that can be beneficial to your own workplace and to your own practice. Um, so with that, I think um, let's go in reverse order this time and we'll start with Kenneth. And why don't you just each tell me or tell the group, I guess, what does inclusion mean to you? 
Uh, in inclusion, um, uh, I, I sort of think inclusion kind of revol uh, or ties to belonging, but inclusion to me means being respected in the workplace, um, feeling comfortable uh, coming to work on a daily basis and really being able to build your, your authentic self and not feeling like you have to, you know, change who you are um, so that other people in the workplace um, will accept you. I think that's, if you, if you have that feeling where you can walk into the office and sort of just be yourself authentically, that's what inclusion is for me. Yeah, I can't reverse alphabetize, but I guess I'll go because <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. Um, I would say when I think about inclusion, I also try to, um, I, I think about just being respectful of different people. Um, it's really funny because I work at, an, at a mainly minority firm where we're like a little United Nations. We have people from Venezuela, from Colombia, from El Salvador, from Uruguay, me, um, Puerto Rico. We literally, and people think, oh, all Hispanics are the same, but that's not true, actually. And so when you have a, a very diverse population that you employ, like I do, we have to be very conscientious of all types of things. And that would include like, you know, just racial differences, cultural differences. I mean, if we, if I would let my staff, they would have a birthday party every day. And that party would last like two hours, literally. Um, so you have to be aware that um, we have to be respectful of all different types of people and different types of places. I all we also I also believe that it means understanding that people are different than you and that's okay and that everyone should feel as if their differences are something to be celebrated, not something to be hidden, not something to be ashamed of. Um, our place has a, my business has a very big, diverse um, religious background. We have people that are agnostic all the way to devout Christians, to devout Muslims. Um, we also have a big age division in our, in our workforce. We have people in their seventies. We have people in their twenties. We have people that are heterosexual, homosexual. I just think that you have to realize that humans come in all shapes and sizes and all beliefs and ideas and histories and backgrounds, and that all of that is beautiful and that they're entitled to be authentic and who they want to be. And you as an employer need to respect that. Um, or as a person, I think actually, especially as an employer, that's how I think about it mainly. But as a person, you should respect that and take all steps to make sure that people know it's okay to be similar or dissimilar to their coworkers and neighbors and that the environment in which you are fostering is allowing them to feel that on, an, on a daily basis. It's always hard to go later in the panel because you're just like, oh, I agree with everything the panelists before me say. So I will say I agree with both Ken and Grace's characterization of what inclusion means. In summary, I guess maybe in a change of wording, inclusion to me means a sense of community in light of all of the differences that the community brings. Um, like I said, Grace touched on this, being able to acknowledge all of the differences that people bring to the table and understanding the enrichment that all of that brings. So that's what inclusion means to me. Okay, um, Sharice, did you wanna offer anything hey, else? Yeah. Right. Perfect. <clears throat> so to me, um, inclusion means everyone. Um, it means making space for everyone, respecting, as Kevin said, everyone, um, and accommodating people for the various things that they um, might need in their life, uh, regardless of where they come from, um, diversity in religion, race, um, mental health accommodations, um, disability accommodations, um, you know, whether you're a parent, a single parent, or, or, you know, whatever time um, flexibility you need in the workplace to have the job work for you as much as you work for the job. And to feel like, as you said, that you're a part of a community when you're there, you're not just, you know, this lone island doing your, your own thing without any support. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so we really wanted in planning this CLE, we really wanted to be able to provide some concrete, tangible ideas that have worked or not worked in these various settings where our panelists um, work and, you know, associate with their colleagues and all of that. And so um, we're going to talk about a couple of different categories of ideas. I think the first um, we wanted to focus on an individual level. What can we individually as attorneys 
who want to create an inclusive environment, what can we do individually to do that in our within our own workplaces, which vary widely? And then we're going to talk about institutional ideas and programs that have been utilized in these various organizations. So first, um, at an individual level, I want each of our panelists, if they can, to just describe what they do each do individually to foster inclusion within their own workplace. And this can be about building relationships or, you know, making sure that you're connecting with colleagues, whether they're in the office or working remotely um, and all of the different things that go into making, you know, taking our own individual part in making sure that we have a, a inclusive workplace. So um, I'm going to, since Izzy made the comment about going first, I'm going to let her go first on this one. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, in, in preparing for this panel, I, I will have to make the disclosure that we all agree that this could be a whole series in within itself. So my, my apologies for trying to condense it, but inclusive practices that I personally implement, um, I try to be as open and genuine as possible with everybody I interact with professionally, right? It's not just peers, it's also clients, opposing counsel, um, anybody that I might be getting mentorship from or anybody I might be mentoring, right? And I think the the flip side of that coin and being genuine is being able to be humble when other people are also genuine about who they are, right? So part of that inclusive practice is a give and take, right? Being able to have conversations with people about um, the the background that you come from and being able to accept people and have the conversation with them about where they come from. And I think part of that is being very, trying to be very um, humble about when you feel like your assumptions have colored your opinions of people, right? I think that that's an important part for me, right? right? Being able to face yourself and say like, oh, I didn't even think about that. That is my, you know, maybe I was being racist and thinking about that, right? So so being able to address it both, both internally and being able to have that discussion externally, like you said, with peers. Um, the, the work from home context, right? Being able to connect with peers virtually, I think just has to be more intentional, right? Like you can have conversations with people in person where it comes up of like, oh, I didn't know this about you, anything like that. But I think virtually I would set, at least in 2020, right? I would set designated times to check in on my colleagues, right? To be like, now, you know, I have this call with you. Tell me how everything is, like what's going on personally. So those are, those are some day-to-day practices that I think um, implement inclusion. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Kenneth, you, since you're unmuted, why don't you go ahead? Sure. So um, I, I think, you know, the, the lesson that I always try to impart to people is that everything, uh, not everything, but a lot of what, you know, we're trying to do in the DEI space revolves around stuff we've learned in kindergarten, which is just to be nice and courteous to other people, speak to people with respect. And, you know, what I try to do on a day to day basis and even when uh, I, I was practicing, um, I would just start my day when I entered the office speaking to the receptionist. Um, as many of you know, a lot of times in law firms, sometimes there's these hierarchies of, you know, attorneys are here, staff are here. And, and I know some of those have to exist um, for purposes of, you know, supervising and respecting things like that. But there's nothing in the attorney handbook that I ever saw, if there was an attorney handbook that said you can't just speak to people, right, and be kind to people. And I find that just simply, you know, saying hi to someone in the morning um, brightens their day because so many people walk by the receptions on a day-to-day -day basis and don't even speak. Um, and likewise with colleagues, you know, I, I recall sitting in my office as a first or second year associate, and I would see other um, associates sometimes going to lunch and things like that, um, that were similarly situated uh, individuals. And um, they would never ask me to go to lunch. And um, finally, I just, one time I said, you know what? I see this group of young associates going, I'm just going to get up and join the group. And it did end up turning out that it wasn't sort of this intentional slight. It's just that they sat in sort of the corner together. My office, unfortunately, was a little bit away. And, um, you know, they were just, we're going to lunch, let's just go. But something like that, like if you are in your office and you notice that, you know, maybe you're forgetting somebody in the group or you notice someone um, doesn't seem to be getting out of the office as much or as frequently, just ask, invite them. You know, I invite them to go get the cup of coffee when you're going to go get the cup of coffee. Because, again, I'm sure, you know, most of us in our offices walk by folks on a day to day basis, um, even in various practice groups, depending on how large your firm is and things of that nature. So 
I think my practice is really just to be kind, right? And just think about all the lessons I learned um, when I was in kindergarten that, you know, can just carry on through um, through life. Um, with respect to now in the hybrid environment, um, when I was uh, still practicing as a partner, the one thing I tried to do with the associates um, that I supervised um, was just reach out to them. I mean, it's so easy to send an email and say, you know, the, the brief is due, where is it, right? Um, but it's not as easy sometimes to just say, you know what, like there's there's nothing due, there, everybody's on point. Let me just send an email and just say, how are you doing? Um, and I found that, again, that was even once we started coming back into the office, you know, the last two years or so, um, that was something that someone, that people mentioned to me was they were very appreciative of that, you know, it wasn't sort of just every time I needed something, I could communicate with them that I would every now and then, and it was like, it wasn't every day. It might've been every month, once a month, it might've been every two weeks, depending on, you know, if I just, you know, happened to do it. But that was something that the younger attorneys um, that I worked for uh, felt like it, you know, made them part of the firm. And so that's just sort of how I try to look at it um, in, in my role on a day-to-day -day basis. That's great. Thank you. I, I just want to piggyback on one comment you made about, you know, taking the initiative to get out of your office, with the lunch group. I had a, we had a new attorney join our office and she emailed me just recently to say, Hey, do you want to go to lunch? I'm trying to meet people. And yeah. I was really impressed with that. But then I also thought I should have been the one to reach <laughs> out to her, right? Like right, that should right. have been on me to, and we have firm announcements. I'm sure most firms do, right? Like so-and-so is joining the firm. This is their first day. Like I made a conscious like goal after she emailed, like, okay, when I see those announcements, my first reaction is going to be email that person, let's set up a lunch, right? So that they get to know people. So that, I mean, as much as I appreciated her initiative, it was like, okay, like I can do the same thing on my end, right? So. Yeah, that, that Melinda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Grace, did you have something you wanted to add? I did. So I just want to say that one of the things that I do is I try to just be intentional. And um, I, I consciously, like, for example, if my, if we make a decision that we're going to promote someone in a team or maybe they, uh, a raise should be given, I always step back and say, okay, who else is in that same level? Who else should be um, looked at? And are we making sure that we're valuing all types of contributions? Because maybe there's a young mom who has to go pick up her kid for daycare. So she's always gone at 3.30 in the afternoon, but she comes in at 6.30. No one sees her but me because I'm the only one that comes in the office early. I try to be very conscientious of rewarding the work, even if it doesn't always fit in the same mold that everyone thinks it's supposed to be. And, you know, and I even just had a real, I won't name names, but I had a discussion with one of my young female associates. And she said, to me, I felt like you gave me this opportunity because the one of the male associates of the same level had been given the same opportunity. I go, well, absolutely. That's exactly right. I said, so, and there's nothing wrong with that. I said, no one under my watch, am I going to see wage disparity between my genders? I said, I will give you the same opportunities. If you choose not to take them because you don't want to, that's completely up to you. And by the way, that is okay too. Not everybody is destined for the partnership track or destined to be at the top of the totem pole. I said, so it's completely fine, but you get to make that choice. I am not going to make it for you. And so that is one of the things as an owner of my own firm, which is why I love being an owner of my own firm, is that I get to live it and breathe it and decide for myself, do I think this is fair? And the other thing that I do is that I try to always do the same thing the same way every time. So if I'm going to give someone a raise, I say the same words. If I'm going to fire someone, I say the same words. If I'm going to reprimand someone, I say the same words. That way there's no, in, I'm trying to map out all the implicit bias that's in me about how I'm I'm interacting with someone um, to make sure that I'm being fair. Because what, what you don't realize is like, I think Ken's story is perfect. He was just in a corner. I mean, he was a victim of geography and he felt excluded. So again, I try, I intentionally mix my teams. I, we move people around. Like we just did our secret Santas and there was some comment about, Hey, we should have a secret Santa for lawyers and a secret Santa for staff. Cause we have, we have 55 people in my office. And I was like, no, 
we're going to do secret Santa for everybody. And so I got some guy that I don't even know who he is. I was like, give me a picture of him so I can know who he is. And I'm sure some poor slug got me and they're terrified, right? But that's good for me and good for them, right? To know that I'm a person and that they're a person and we're just going to like have to interact. So anyway, it's a long way of selling the story of it is being intentional, and, and when I was, I remember when I was on the bar commission, um, Herm Olson was my, was my contact when I was an Umba rep, which means I didn't, couldn't vote or anything. And Herm always said to me, you have to say it every time. Are there any women and minorities on this, on this panel? Have we thought about, have we been inclusive in our selection of, of winners? And, and he sticks in my head. Every time I make a decision, I ask myself, I remember that. And I ask myself, am I being, am I being inclusive? Because if not, Guess what, guys? We get too busy and we forget. So he's just bringing it to the forefront of all your decisions. Go ahead, Sherry. The, the thing that I wanted to add to that is I love Grace's um, comment about intentionality. Um, I think that it's systemic, even, even though it's personal, right? So you can have personal mm. systems in place to make people feel comfortable and make them feel seen and heard. Um, one of the things I just have to say, um, even though I'm a partner at the appellate group, uh, my partner, Emily Adams, has called me on the phone and said to me, hey, how are your hours working? How is this working out for you? How's your schedule working out for you? Do you need to pull back a little or would you like a little bit more? Um, and just help me as, because the, the main thing going on right now for me is juggling family and firm. And so she's, you know, carving out the space for me to have a voice about my schedule, which, um, you know, it seems, it seems like it would be obvious since I'm a partner, but the fact that she came to me and said, Hey, there's room for you. Um, you, you don't need to feel pressure one way or the other was just something that I appreciated so much. And so I think that I think that when you have a new team member, you can, you know, aside from inviting them to lunch, maybe plan to say the equivalent of that, you know, not only how's your schedule working out for you, but are you feeling like you're a member of the team? Who has introduced themselves to you? Um, who's, you know, how many friends do you have here? You know, what, what committees would you like to be a part of? What can I do to increase your, um, your community membership? Um, so I think that there, you know, and you can, you can take that and apply it to anything, but just that intentionality and making sure that, you know, like everybody talked about, that there's kindness, that people are being seen and heard. And I'm going to add one more thing too. So we have a, we have a commitment to our community. We really do. We're constantly, we do lots of extra stuff. Like we do almost a consulate symposium or we speak at seminars almost every Saturday or Sunday. We give away gift certificates. We give away so many things to our community. And so I ask our staff to do that, which is a lot. And they can say no, by the way, but most of the time they think it's fun because what I find is that you build bonds by doing parallel things to each other. So we do a lot of like, hey, let's go to the Christmas box and we're actually going to like cook a meal or we're actually going, we, so we do a lot of, in, like we have a Santa tree. Um, we collect baskets for our immigrant families who just got TPS or what temporary protective status. We do that not because I, I love it and it's kind of who I am and I, I want to give, but it makes them feel like they're part of something that's bigger than them and that they're they're part of it too. So we try really hard to make our team feel like they're part of a team um, rather than just coming in and punching a clock and scanning in documents and filling out forms, which pretty much sounds horrible to me. Um, I want them to love their work. And guess what? That's how they become friends with each other, right? And they, maybe they hate each other too. It happens. We're not perfect for God's sakes. But we do actually make them feel like they want to come to work and that this is a place that I'm proud to be a part of. So I think that's something that businesses can actually do. Um, it's not just like, hey, we're going to do the um, United Way, which is a great charity. We should do it. We're also going to give money out of our paycheck. But actually getting your hands dirty a little bit and feeling grateful for who you are is a wonderful way to build teamwork and inclusiveness in your work environment. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Grace. And I think um, I've taken several DEI courses and a lot of them talk about that, that sense of 
not just community, but meaning within your work, right? And that you're part of it. And some of that is, yeah, getting together to do things outside of your normal workday. And some of that is um, helping each other to see the role that each person plays, right? To say like, mm-hmm. oh, I didn't understand that was part of your job, like, mm-hmm. or that, that, you know, and I think some of that understanding of one another's roles is also really important. And maybe that is part organizational part personal, but um, that's a really good point. And um, also with Sharice, the, the intentionality I think is it, like incredibly important. So um, let's talk now though, we're gonna segue. And I should have mentioned this before, if any of the um, people here on the Zoom have any questions, you can definitely add those in the chat. And I'm happy to all keep track of those and bring them up with the panel in real time if it makes sense or we can save them for the end. We'll also have a question and answer period at the end too that will be specifically dedicated to that. But if you don't wanna forget your question, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, So I think we've heard some really great suggestions about what we can do at an individual level to foster inclusion. I'm hoping now we can talk about organizational or institutional measures that can be taken. And I have to give credit to Izzy. She came up with a few buckets of, um, you know, categories of things that can be done by organizations, including institutional incentives, um, marketing and advertising. In other words, how do we show other people outside the firm? And I think Grace just gave us a great example, like that we care and that we actually are investing in DEI and then substantive training and programs. So we're gonna kind of go through those categories one by one and get some um, input from the panelists. But so the first one that I wanna talk about is institutional incentives. And we're talking about things like compensation, hours requirements, um, committees or groups that you know the firm itself has created to pr- you know provide a space for certain people. Um, and so I wanna kind of go through um, and talk with each person because we do have such different types of organizations represented here to hear what's being done by your specific firm that you found that you have found useful. Um, and, and we'll also then talk about some of the things that, um, are not so useful, but if you feel like that's a a good time to weave those into, we can do that as well. So why don't we start with Kenneth, since he represents a larger firm, um, and then we can kind of work from there. So, go ahead. Sure. so um, you know, our firm, I think, uh, total is uh, attorney count is about a little over 300 um, total office counts, probably double that, maybe a little bit even higher. Um, but our firm, um, what we've done um, and, and I've only been here since uh, September. So the D, so we actually have a DEI billable credit that goes towards your end of the year billable um, billable hours. And we allow up to 125 hours. Of, of time to do DEI related work. But that also is tied to our pro bono commitment as well. So it's really a com- combination of the two, uh, 125 hours that you can um, contribute towards the end of your year uh, billable hour um, requirement. And so I'm not sure that, uh, to be quite frank, that ne- necessarily translates to sort of making the uh, environment more inclusive. Uh, but what it does do is it gets uh, our attorneys more engaged in what our strategic plan is. And in 2024, as I get more time under my belt, I am going to be pushing more folks to uh, to use that billable credit hour uh, because it's not it's it's not being utilized, at least um, from what I can tell now, uh, just you know, being here the first 90 days, um, it's not being utilized as as much. And I think um, to incentivize folks to do that. That will hopefully then um, increase uh, sort of like, you know, the creation of this inclusive law firm. And, and I say that because mm-hmm. some of the um, some of the suggestions I'm going to have uh, are simply like things we've talked about. Someone in the office in another practice group or someone that doesn't look like you, oh, yeah. ask them to lunch. Right. Um, just just to have a conversation with them when you're at bar association events. You know, again, someone that doesn't look like you um, or that you're not normally uh, accustomed to talk to. Just go reach out and talk to them. And so obviously they'll get a bill of our credit for attending, you know, an event that's diversity related. But at that same time. You know, there will also be, you know, sort of creating an internal uh, inclusive environment. And so also for the legal profession, hopefully making that uh, profession more inclusive. So that's kind of how we, you know, tie. um, That's what we do as a larger firm. I think, you know, we're able to do that because, um, 
you know, uh, with with the billable, you know, number that people are bringing in, 125 hours is is not taking too much time away, and and also from the bottom line, at the end of the day, we're business, right? Um, but also, I think, uh, you know, that even having that incentive. Um, me and my role, I'm still going to have to push people to really become more engaged and utilize that credit. So that's how we do it. Um, the other thing, I know you talked about uh, other incentives, compensation, et cetera. That's something that's on my my list of, you know, during my, so I'm just calling this my discovery phase of our firm. Like, what are we doing in this space? And so one of the things I do want to do is tie compensation to um, the efforts that she's put into DNI. So maybe next year, if we're on the program, I'll let you know if that, that that's gone through, because I'm sure that's going to have to have, be a discussion, obviously, with our executive committee and things. But I do think it's important. It's just like, you know, business development, marketing, and things that you have to do as an attorney. And if you do those well, there is a compensation piece tied to that. And I likewise, I think there should be related to DEI. But so, you know, from our AMLAW 200 sort of space, that's how we are trying to, you know, create more inclusion um, and, and how we incentivize it. Perfect. Thanks, Kenneth. Do you, do you, does your firm have any sort of employee resource groups or anything like that that you've implemented that have been successful? I can't remember if we talked about that or not. Um, yes, we do have employee resource groups. Um, we have, um, I think it's seven right now, um, you know, Asian American, African American veterans. Um, we have our pride group, um, the LGBTQ+. Plus. Um, we have... Um, Hispanic Americans group, um, next gen, which is sort of our, you know, next generation of folks coming up, you know, I guess I'm Gen X, I guess whatever blows Gen X, millennials and, and Gen Y, et cetera. Um, and we also have some requests to um, to start a disability ERG um, and also an indigenous peoples ERG. So um, we are, uh, we do have, uh, we do have employee resource groups. And again, I think, you know, that's another thing where, um, it sort of builds inclusion, right? So now you can have so you can have conversation in a safe space. I think the bigger thing about that is, and um, this sort of relates to the um, students for students for fair admissions case, which is those ERGs are actually open to everyone, right? We don't exclude anyone. It's so allies are um, able to join those groups, which you know actually is is yeah, I think very beneficial to at least the meetings I've been on to have some individuals who sort of don't identify specifically with the group. Um, but our allies and help support, you know, um, the mission of, of each of our ERGs. That's great. That's awesome. Um, is there any, I mean, do the committees, and I hate to put you on the spot again, do the committee no. kind of run their own, their own work or is there any sort of structure? Is it kind of up to them? Yeah. So, so yeah. So again, in my 90 day exploratory phase, right. Sure. Um, one thing I have recognized is that they need more guidance, um, because, uh, you know, obviously the, the ERGs are for our attorneys and staff, um, attorneys typically, I think are chairing these as of today. I think there may be a mix, but, you know, but obviously like, again, it's a business, right? The attorneys need to bill hours. So sometimes they don't necessarily have the time, um, necessarily the time to plan and organizing. So one of my strategies uh, going into 2024 is going to be, I have a DEI coordinator that works in my department and she's going to be sort of tasked with um, keeping up with the ERGs, ensuring that they meet. Uh, we haven't decided if it's going to be monthly or quarterly yet, but um, there's going to be a set schedule for their meetings. Um, and we are sort of drafting bylaws. We're helping them sort of get this together. Um, mission statements, we are um, having sort of a, a draft and we're saying, you know, we're going to give it to them and say, you know, adopt this uh, or rather adapt this to what your mission is um, and things like that. But we're trying to like, give them sort of spoon fed information because, again, we recognize that, you know, um, that it's important for the attorneys to bill and, and the administrative staff to support. Um, and But we do want them to have a little bit more guidance and more structure uh, because they can, I think they can get more out of it than they have, um, you know, prior to my uh, uh, my being um, employed in this position. No, that's great input. Um, I, I actually asked because at my firm, we have incredible women that I adore and I love it when we get together and we have a women's group, but we're not very good at being consistent in meeting yeah. and those kinds of things. And then we also have our DEI committee that meets regularly, but that's partly because I, as the chair, have asked like someone to remind me, you know, like, will you tell me when we need, like, when I need to send out a reminder about a meeting, because otherwise I'll just get in my flow and forget that we're meeting and then suddenly remember six months later. And so I think the like 
having someone who's helping to guide that, especially for attorneys, we all know we're not always the best at staying organized. So I think that's in incredibly important. So thank right. you. Right. Yeah, and the one thing I would suggest, though, if you are a, on a smaller platform, because I did come from a, a smaller platform and where I was director of diversity, inclusion and litigation partner. Right. So trying to do two things at once, which is, you know, it's difficult, right, because they're really two full time jobs. Um, but what we did at my prior firm was we sort of um, allowed me to sort of use the marketing department. Um, as sort of like, you know, they had marketing assistants and things like that. So they would help me with some of my planning for events and things like that. And then the chief marketing officer obviously would kind of oversee them and sort of monitor sort of what I was working with them on. So that was the way that we sort of worked it and, and on smaller platform is we sort of made it more of a collaborative uh, approach, whereas now we have an actual DEI department in, on, in this space. That's great. Can idea. I make a comment, Melinda? Like, I yeah, hate things about me. I hate meetings about meetings. Like that really annoys me. I'm like, I yeah. don't want to just talk about this indefinitely. So I think you have to know where you're going. So like, right. if you come up with a plan of action, like where do I want to go? Like, what am I hoping to accomplish? Am I hoping to build camaraderie? Am I hoping just to have, every, is it an education yeah. platform? And once you come up with a plan of where you want to end up, then it's so much easier. Because otherwise we're like, oh, we're just getting together and we're talking about diversity. Well, this is awesome. No, to me, that's not super, and I mean, I'm yeah. not being, I'm just super practical because I'm a litigator and I'm busy, right? But if you're going to tell me that four times a year, I'm going to get together with all the women in my firm and have some discussions about life work balances I can do that right so I just tell you that if you give me a plan or if I know where I'm going I can make a plan so yeah. that would be my recommendation to anyone that's listening if you want to go home and take this to your firms and come up ask yourself what you want and what you hope to accomplish and then implement it I mean this isn't rocket science right I mean like we're just trying to make your workplace better and by the way this is such good business People stay. The brain drain is real. Retraining your paralegal, retraining your staff is so expensive. Every time I have to go back over and teach someone my filing system, I cringe on the inside about all the lost billable hours, right? So <laughs> if you make it a great place to work, people love you and they stay. And if mm -hmm. people feel like they're part of a team and they love you, they work harder. They actually, they don't just act like robots and do their tasks. They actually problem solve and they come up with ideas and they come up with ways to implement and then they got buy-in and then it's their firm too and then you're making lots of money which is what i want to do too <laughs> right I mean, i'm a business owner it's right? a business. So, i mean it's a business and there's nothing wrong with it being a business but that's what i'm saying like these meetings are great but tell me where you're going to go and then i'll right. come up with a plan for it and right. then just do and it yeah i think Can that's I where kenneth was going with that for sure yeah go ahead sharice yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off what Grace just said. If you if you make your firm a place where people feel comfortable and also that's flexible for them, that listens to them, a place where they can bring, hey, this is what my needs are. And if that looks like a plan, like Grace was saying, then that's what it looks like. Here, here's a plan for, for me to be able to work these hours and to do it in a way that I can do that. Um, I recently attended a CLE with the five Utah Supreme Court justices. I don't know how many of you guys were there, but they talked about how, you know, however many years ago when they were developing these plans to be able to work um, as, as moms, that um, they had to get their bosses on board and that there was a really huge pushback to them being able to work part-time. I mean, just a huge pushback. Um, a lot of them said they would take not a lot of them, there weren't that many, but um, I think a couple of them said, you know, they, they would work 75% of the hours for 50% of the pay, which to me doesn't make sense. That, that math doesn't add up at all. Um, why? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so what we do at our firm is we compensate hourly. We compensate for all hours worked, whether they're billable or not. If we have asked you to do something, if it's part of the firm, we pay you for it. Um, and we offer flexibility, which means that you can take, you can work more hours one month than another month, and it doesn't have to be consistent. Um, the area of law that we practice is very well situated for that with, um, with people being able to pitch in and help, um, being able to have our briefing deadlines set months and months in advance so that we can work a little bit more one week and less another week and, and things like that. It's just, it's very friendly to flexibility. Um, 
which is one of the reasons why I love it. But we offer our attorneys flexibility and we pay them for everything that they work. So for example, this might be extreme, but for example, we just went to the women of the law retreat. We paid our attorneys to go to the retreat because they were away from their personal lives and they were spending time with us as a firm. So we paid them for that. Um, and so, so every hour that they are asked to work at the firm, they're paid. And I think that that's important because not a, not a lot of people have dual income. Not a lot of people have, you know, two nannies helping them out. They can't just work for free. Um, you know, how are you, how are you going to meet your admin hours if you're not being compensated? So um, that's one of the things we do. Another thing that you mentioned earlier, maybe, I, I'm not sure if you asked or if it's just in our outline, but remote work. Um, we, we have an office and we also have attorneys who work remotely and um, we have, I think about half and half work remotely. So some of us are here in Utah. Some of us are not in Utah. So, um, one of our attorneys likes to travel a lot and she will work from Spain and Portugal and you know wherever it is in the world that she is. Um, one of our attorneys took six months to live in Peru um, while she studied Spanish and she worked from Peru for a while. And so um, because we're able to argue virtually we're able to accommodate that for our attorneys so um we you know we're just it's just really about accommodating people where they are and what their needs are and I think on that note Sharice I think that even regardless of practice area a lot of those suggestions can be incorporated in different forms right like if you have good communication among your team for instance like I mean at our firm we cover for people if they're out of town, right? Like if there's a hearing and you're going to be out of town and it is in person, like, can someone cover this for me? You know, and like, granted, we have the yeah. luxury of having a lot of people, right? But mm -hmm. um, I think that it can be implemented so people can do what they need to do in their personal lives, like you said. So, yeah. 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 Um, Grace, did you have any other ideas on the institutional side? Since you are, um the boss, right? One of the bosses, like what have you done at an institutional level to um, either compensate people for DEI worker inclusion or, um, or make your compensation model more inclusive? Or um, do you have any other committees or groups or things like that that you've implemented? So there's nine of us as attorneys and like 50 staff. So um, we just, I mean, we're kind of small, if that makes sense. We have a big staff mm -hmm. presence, but we just have like nine attorneys. What I try to do is I try to just follow an equality among my um, compensation. So that just because I have a pregnant female doesn't mean she doesn't make, she makes less than my male. But I mean, honestly, I still have people say to me sometimes, well, he has a family. I'm like, uh, so does she. I mean, I, I, that still is the things that I hear, right? So I'm just conscientious of reminding people of those stereotypes. And also, um, you know, I have older attorneys and younger attorneys too. And I know that's a real big difference as well. But if they have the same skill levels, then their compensation is going to be the same. Like you don't just, I mean, I, I think that we try to make things merit-based, but I also am flexible. I had this conversation with one of my new associates yesterday. He's from Puerto Rico. He just started like two months ago and he wasn't going to go home for Christmas. And I said, what? You're not going home for Christmas? He's like, well, I don't have any vacation time. And I said, wait. Okay. As a former employment lawyer, I will say, you do not have a right to vacation time, but I have the discretion to let you go home for Christmas. I mean, you're so uh, yes, you can leave on Thursday, I mean, you can leave on Friday before Christmas and come back on Wednesday, even though you've only been here two months. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to make you be in Salt Lake City by yourself on Christmas Eve. You don't know anyone. No. So just, I mean, that. I don't know how to say that that's compensation in the sense that I gave him vacation days, but that's just me being a person, right? I mean, that's just being a person. And so, but by the way, I was talking to him and I asked him, what do you do for Christmas? And he said, I don't know anyone. I just moved into my apartment. I don't even have a couch. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, and I just thought, there's no way I'm letting you do that. Um, so that's not some institutional grand scheme, but it is having communications with my people. And I have, I, have a, I have a pregnant young lady too, and she's all freaking out about having a baby in June. And I was like, I cannot guarantee anything to you under the law, 
but you know that I am not going to let you starve while you're on maternity leave. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, that is not going to happen. I said, there's no, there's no legal right to compensation during that time under FMLA, but I am your friend and your boss, and I am not going to let you lose your house. Are you kidding me? I mean, so I just wish that I could make it more formal, but we're still too small. Um, but I don't know if, I mean, you employment lawyers can write me later on and say, don't say that, Grace. Right. Um, but, <laughs> but, but that is what I will do because but, she's my employee and I don't want to leave her hanging while she has a baby. And anyway, I, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say, but to that point, Grace, I mean, I think that's when we're talking about, you know, are, do you feel respected at work? Right. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, the opposite of what you're saying is, is, you know, is on a smaller platform. You have a little bit of that flexibility to figure mm -hmm. out how can this situation work? Right. And taking and making the effort to do that. Right. Like, like I know we have like a non, vacation policy for attorneys because at the end of the year if you don't have your bill hours you don't have your bill hours right mm -hmm. and so um but uh you know but saying that you know um again how do you build an inclusive environment when your uh you know your colleague uh does leave from attorney leave hopefully she gets through it and you know we all know that's tough you know um when, when you have to take off um but she's probably going to come back and work for you Right. Mm -hmm. If you do end up taking care of her in some small way, shape or form, mm -hmm. and that's much better for you. Right. Because now you don't have to hire someone, train someone new, et cetera. Right. So just taking exactly. those little intentional steps like that. Yeah. It might not be the best business decision if you look at like the straight numbers for you. But on the end of the day, as a smaller shop, it's going to be the best business decision. And mm -hmm. I think those are the types of little things where when we look at DEI as a whole. It's those taking steps like that to sometimes are a little bit outside the box um that um sorry i just saw a question pop up uh but are a little bit outside the box that help um help us you know create these inclusive workplaces yeah mm -hmm. and i've had a couple of questions come directly to me that are on the topic that both of you are talking about including um vacation or time off right and then compensation and the questions revolve around um on the time off i've and i've had both experiences where i've had set time off and an open model, right? Where I can take mm -hmm. the time I need when I yeah. need it. And I think there's pros and cons to both, right? And I just am hoping that maybe some of the panels can speak to what you do in your firm and if it's working or if you have any thoughts about what you think has actually been more workable for your um, colleagues and for you. And then the other question that maybe we can talk about and you all can think about is, um, what thoughts do you all have on transparency in terms of compensation models, not only for attorneys, but for staff as well? How do we promote transparency and is that actually helpful for inclusion? So I know those are two big questions. Anyone wanna take the time off piece first? Uh, I'll, I'll do time off just cause I, I see it. I've been on the other side of it as an attorney and now um, I am thinking about, you know, ways to incentivize both people coming into the office uh because again um i think that the hybrid market uh, the hybrid work way workplace or however you phrase that is good but i do see that for younger attorneys um they're missing out on that mentorship piece that you know i just remember you know unfortunately you know practically 20 years ago sitting in the office you know sometimes playing solitaire until my partner left right <laughs> because i didn't mm -hmm. have anything to do but i felt like i couldn't leave before the partner you mm -hmm. know and i know that that's not how we work nowadays and i know this generation doesn't want to necessarily work nowadays but i do think that um having more flex a more flexible workplace but at the same time having some structure um actually does make sense for both the di perspective being more inclusive but also because you want to train the younger generation um you know to be better lawyers and so uh again i like i think you mentioned i see the pros and cons of sort of having a more open workplace and less but i do think there has to be uh, as we develop to sort of what this new work world looks like post COVID, there has to be i think a balance um um for, 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 you know, is it really an open, flexible, and we don't care as long as you build like, you know, your 2000 hours and we never see you, or do we still want to have a, a, a workplace where people want to come in at least once a week and maybe you do it as a team or, or you structure that. Um, but again, I think there's just something missing with the younger generation and, and the mentorship and how are they going to develop um, by not coming in as consistently. Yeah. That's a great yeah point. Go ahead, Izzy. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can jump in from the perspective of being a newer attorney and sort of being closer to being in this position where we're looking at these 
alternative options, right? As far as, you know, I think there's a couple of pieces just to build off of what Ken said. There's the, there's the flexible work time and then balancing that with receiving substantive mentorship, right? Which is, I think we can all agree, essential to being um, a good lawyer. So I do, I do think the flexibility piece, while it, it it's important for inclusion, I don't think it, it does change what we see as traditional formats of mentorship, right? And and it's I, I do think that being in person holds its own place for mentorship, but I also think it's the time to explore different ways that we can mentor attorneys with these, you know, not you know, before you do it as it comes, right? Like you seek out a partner because you're both in the office, right? And I do think now it has to be, and we, and this is a common theme of what we've talked about, more intentional. <laughs> we're, we're saying, you know, we have, we have uh, lawyers with more years of experience being like, I want to bring up this new generation of attorneys. And this is part of what makes me a good attorney is I'm going to be talking to new attorneys, right? And so I'm going to reach out to them and bring them forward and give them what I know. And that's going to be enriching to my practice as well. So I think, I think from that person, I think from that perspective, it goes along with being able to, um, implement flexible, uh, vacation and um, work time while still being very conscious of the ways in which we can develop new attorneys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably all comes back to communication, right? Too. And feeling like you can communicate openly with one another at work to say like, I need a little more time or, or you're taking too much time, you know, or whatever the case may be, because I think there has to be some give and take there for sure. Um, Grace, did you have, um, input on the time off piece, and then maybe we can get thoughts on the comp transparency of compensation. Um, I think everybody needs time off. I mean, honestly, I mean, yeah. I don't think we're not machines, so I don't care. I mean, it, and I think that we should treat people as adults and as people. So when you say to me, I'm just done. I, I, I can't stand opposing counsel. This case is driving me crazy. I just need to go to the movies. I'd be like, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. I mean, in my world, I'm just like, but but I do tell my female associates, like when they go on their maternity doctor's appointments, I was like, you don't have to tell everybody your business, just so you know. Um, so if you need that mental health day, why don't you just take it? Like that, that's what I say. I mean, and just hopefully you're respected and and you work hard enough in your environment that you don't have to come in and tell me what you're exactly doing. You're going to say, Hey, I have an appointment out of the office. I need to go to, I'm going to be gone tomorrow afternoon because you just need a mental health day. I think that's just normal. I mean, I know that I take them. Um, so I, I expect other humans to take them too. So I think that's part again of just paying attention. I mean, I can walk through my office and I see someone and they look stressed and I'm like, Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Like, do we need something? Um, is there something I can do to help you? That is my job as the supervisor, I think too, right? Um, just to be aware. Again, it's intentionalness. So anyway, so, so taking time off, I think you should allow it. I let my people have the flexibility to tell me for themselves. I mean, if my dog died and I'm sweeping at my desk, yes, you can go home, right? I mean, who would say no to that? But you'd be surprised actually, guys. Um, and I think it's our job as the leaders to make our environments be where someone loses their dog or their dad and they need time off. They should be able to take it. And the fact that it's even a question to me is beyond the pale. Like, what are you talking about? Of course, people can't just bill mi mindlessly for hours and hours and days at a time. First of all, I, I need to go to the gym and like get my brain clean. So then suddenly a brilliant idea hits me. So you have to recognize that as the employer, that your staff is not going to work as well if you don't give them some breathers. So I, mean, I don't know if that answers your question, Melinda, but I will tell you that I am conscientious of that because I live it myself. Right. So no, I think that's exactly right. Right. Like we just have to be conscious of that. And, um, and Charisse, I, do you have something else? Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say that as a firm leader, it's really important to be transparent about taking time off so that you, just like Grace was saying, you give permission to um, your associates to be able to feel comfortable doing that as well. So, you know, you have a doctor's appointment or you have something, you know, you don't have to say what it is, but you know, hey guys, I'm gonna be out of the office for these hours. Um, you won't be able to get a hold of me or whatever. You know, it's just really important. I love um, 
that both of the partners that I practice with will tell me about their naps. You know, <laughs> like, oh, I had a headache. I took the day off. Um, I was going to work really hard on this brief and I took a nap instead. Um, I just, I love that. And then guess what? You're so much more clear and refreshed when you do turn to your work. So it's just so important to give people the flexibility to be refreshed and to be, you know, rejuvenated and revived when they're working and not wear themselves down. But also as Grace was saying, you know, to live it, to live it as a firm leader and show your team that it's okay. And not only that it's okay, that it's preferred. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, when I was a young associate, I took a nap at my desk and I had to put my head on my desk and fell asleep with like the rings of my notebook on my face and a partner knocked on my door and I was like, I'm fine. And we laughed for a while about how he, it was obvious I'd been taking a nap and it was fine. Right. <laughs> but Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, re um, I remember when I was clerking at the Utah Supreme Court, I was pregnant. I was very pregnant. Yeah. And um, I would walk down that long hall in the chambers uh, corridor all the way to the end and turn left. And there was a couch that was hidden back there. And I would go do that. And, you know, Justice Pierce would tell me, he was like, there's this couch over here and there's a room over here with couches in it. And this is where all the clerks nap. And so he, he told me, you know, this, these are the napping stations. Feel free That's to great. use them. You know, it was just, it was awesome. He was That's great. really great. Um, can we transition? Does anyone have thoughts on transparency in compensation? I think this is actually a really important question. If people have thoughts on how we can be more transparent, because I know I've been in workplaces where the transparency is along a spectrum, right? Where we're not totally sure how we're going to be compensated and then we're grateful or not at the end of the year, right? So, and then others where it's very clear. And so I don't know, um, Grace, you're unmuted. Do you have any thoughts about how you can be more transparent with your staff and attorneys and how they're being compensated? Yeah, so again, as a leader, I try to be fair. But, uh, so like, I always work under the expectation that they're gonna find out what the other person is making. And I ask myself, would that cause a problem? And if it's going to cause a problem, I don't do it because like I was recruiting for a new paralegal. I have one making whatever X amount of dollars. And then she has 13 years experience. I was going to hire another guy and he only had seven years experience, but he wanted the same amount. And so I had a conversation with my partner. I said, okay, we either have to raise my person to, to call the existing paralegal to be above that person as we bring them in, if this is what they need, if this is what the market is dictating, then maybe our other person is under market. Mm -hmm. Right. And so rather than looking at our people as resources that I'm going to exploit, like, oh, look, I got this person for cheap. I'm going to say the market is demanding this. I, I believe this person has value. And so I'm going to compensate them in a way that I can keep them. Because once they find out that I hired this new person at the same level they're making, I'm going to get discontent. So again, it's just being intentional. So yeah. I, I don't tell, I, mean, I don't publish everyone's salaries, but I, I have to live with the rig percussions if I, if I think it's being unfair. So, and plus if someone is loyal and good for you and you feel like they, sh why shouldn't I give them a raise? And so sure. when I, I, I find that influx of new staff does raise my existing staff because I am trying to make, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to make them feel valued because I don't want them to leave. Does that make sense? That's the last yeah. thing I want to have happen. Yeah, absolutely. I want them, yeah, to stay. So that's kind of how I handle it. I don't know if that's anything formal, but it's just been the way we do it. Sure. Is there any, for any of you, I'll open this for the panel. Have, have these compensation decisions been communicated to you or do you communicate them to your, you know, um, employees or staff, like, so that they have an understanding of how these decisions are being made. Izzy, you unmuted. And I don't know if you had something else you wanted to add, but you can go ahead. I don't know if I can answer your last question anyway, because I'm not making the compensation decisions, but it's, I, I will say as someone who's a first generation lawyer and a first generation college student, um, one of the, I don't know if I want to say coping mechanisms, but one of the, um, things that I have done to navigate a world that is completely unfamiliar to me, right, is to get all of this information. Like if you had asked me how much a lawyer made in my first year of law school, I'd be like, I'm not sure. I was taught that they probably make a lot, right? So, so as far as transparency goes, that's important to someone who's 
being introduced to the law for the first time, right? The industry for the first time. We don't have family members to ask about how much we should make, right? We're, we're getting this from mentors. We're getting it from peers. And I think that's where the transparency really matters, right? It's for people who really need that information to know what's going on. And, you know, coupled with transparency and compensation, it's also transparency in how the business runs and understanding your compensation, right? Um, one, to, to give your employees that that understanding of where they where they fit and and to see how how fair it is right um and then also to the the flip side of it to train potentially future leaders in the law and leaders in the firm so i i do think that transparency piece is important from from the employee associate new lawyer side as well I'm going to just echo that. And I, we have a comment in the chat that I really appreciate that um, this person's firm has a written compensation plan that applies to all lawyers and it's given to everyone about how increases work and how to move higher and how to make more money, right? Because everyone wants that and wants to be successful. Um, and I'll just echo, I hadn't really thought about this until the, the earlier question in the chat, but when I was a summer associate and our firm still does this, we um, have pretty regular attorney luncheons on Thursday where you get together and talk about different things. And there's an attorney that's in charge of, you know, um, identifying the topics for those. But when I was a summer associate, our firm president decided he wanted to have a presentation on how everyone is compensated for the summer associates so that we could understand what would what it would take really to be successful at the firm and how to become a partner one day, even though it's, it's pretty lockstep, right? And I just, I was with Izzy. I didn't know lawyers. I had no background in that. And I was like, oh, that's actually really helpful to know that like those three factors are really important <laughs> and I should start working on the one that I like did not even register on my radar. And so, um, and it maybe should have, but it just wasn't there in my like context for what I was doing for my job. So I think that to the extent you can provide that information up front to people, it is incentivizing too, to know exactly what you need to do to be successful. Well, it's funny when I was writing things that I do to try to not be inconclusive was I wrote down no secrets, like mm -hmm. all information equally shared. And it's kind of the same concept, right? Because right. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm I'm a kid of immigrants. My parents, first generation American. I don't even know how to get, I don't know what the ACTs were. My parents had never taken the ACTs. So my high school counselor told me what that was. I felt like the whole world was a secret. Like there was like all this information that I didn't have access to because I was poor and I was an immigrant, I was an immigrant's kid. And so I, as a conscious, as because of that, I hate when people keep secrets from me. Like, I feel like it's a disadvantage. So I try to be transparent in the way I present things to people. Like when I hire a new paralegal and I give you a raise, I'm going to say to you, Hey, I'm giving you a raise because I'm hiring a new paralegal. They're coming in in a lateral, but because of the disparities in your, in your skill levels, I believe that you need to bump up in order to make that work. I just tell them like, yeah. there's no mystery there. Right. Because I don't like to people to hide things from me now. Um, I don't give tell everyone, everyone, everything, right? Because that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's where I believe it's appropriate and where I think it's motivating and where I think it builds trust and egalitarianism, I will share the information. But, and I think that's what you're talking about, Melinda. Like you didn't know where to go because no one ever told you. And so the first time you see it laid out, it's super eye opening. So there's my two yeah. cents on that. And I, I think maybe, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think the corollary of that is if you're in a decision-making capacity, and you're worried about having, like, if you were worried about explaining compensation to someone, maybe it's time to take a look at why you would be worried about that, right? Like, why are, why can't you be per perfectly transparent about things? And there may be good reasons why, but, um, you know, whether it's someone's private life that you need to keep private or whatever, but um, I think that's probably a self-reflection thing, right? Um, okay, Izzy, I realized that I went on a tangent on questions before I actually asked for anything that you had prepared on the institutional incentive side. Did you have anything you wanted to add before we jump to our next topic? Uh, maybe just one note, again, as coming from being a new lawyer, one of the things that we, you know, I looked at with my firm was whether or not that there was credit for doing things that I cared about, right? Like Euclid being one of them, being involved with Euclid and getting credit for that, right? Be, if, if I would have to compromise or whether or not it was seen as valuable. And for, I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm in a firm that, that, does, that recognizes that type of work, but there's that institutional incentive of acknowledging when 
Um, there's diversity work outside of just the, the traditional billable hour. That's a benefit to the, to the firm. And we've talked about this sort of indirectly, but still acknowledging that as equally important, right. Yeah. As it fits into the business context. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, we have a question that maybe I want to address really quickly, um, in the chat that asks whether any of you are worried about DEI in light of recent, you know, Supreme Court decisions and even legislative efforts here in Utah and things like that. Um, are we worried that some of these things are stepping over any sort of legal line? And Kenneth, I don't know if you were wanting to address that question, but. Um, yeah, sure. I'll address it. Um, no, um, I mean, I, I think one of the, I, I think one of the biggest problems um, we have today, unfortunately, is there's been a, obviously a heightened scrutiny on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion um tied to um academic admissions and and it's two i mean they're they're really they're really separate things right and of course you know like lawyers you know properly do they find ways to extend things to apply to other areas and i think certainly with the diversity fellowships that have been sort of challenged and then most law firms that i see um have seen that have been challenged like particularly the you know perkins cooey i think it is one morgan forrester they did take off the descriptors um, for whom would qualify for their diversity fellowship. So it no longer says, um, you know, um, you know, African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, disability, LGBTQ, et cetera. They took all those off and have just opened up these fellowships to sort of be, you know, definitely race neutral. Um, we already have, you know, I think um, I'm not employed, but I, think, I believe Title VII just bars already making employment decisions based on race and things like that. So, you know, those those you know people weren't really violating those things anyway, and specifically with DEI. And the thing that I like to I, I like to explain to people is um, DEI is not human resources. DEI is not uh, the marketing department, anything like that. We work collaboratively with those departments to look broadly, sort of right at at what policies are in place at the firm. So, for example, I don't go out and hire any attorney or any staff at our firm, but what I do look at is um, you know, how are we doing it, right? Because if we say that we want our um, firm to represent the United States, right, or our markets, um, how do we broaden our recruiting base so that it does that? And so it's not about me, me saying, okay, we need 10 more, you know, Black lawyers or 10 more Asian lawyers, things like that, because you can't set quotas, right? That's illegal. But what I can say is right now, our firm is not broadening the net wide enough. So why don't you look at what your, um, um, where, where you're recruiting, right? Because if we recruit broader, then of course our firm will look different. Um, if we maybe change the way we interview, right? And one of the things that we're going to look at is having a set of questions that we ask every single candidate um, in conjunction, obviously, because you want to be smart about like, okay, you don't want to bring a, you know, a, a, a mergers and acquisition lawyer playing, doing employment law, right? So you got to sometimes get into the substance, but sort of some sort of those general feel, feel, feel good questions. Let's just ask everyone the same. Let's get the feel for everyone's personality based on the same questions. Cause this whole question of fit is where sometimes I think you lose, you lose people because then you get into implicit bias. And I mean, again, that's a whole nother program, but then that's where that comes in. So I don't worry. I, I I'm not worried that diversity equity is ever going to be illegal because I don't think that, um, Right now, I, don't, I think the biggest problem is a lot of people don't understand what it is. I think a lot of people think that DEI is like a, like affirmative action admissions, which is we realize that there's underrepresented groups that aren't getting certain opportunities. So let's make sure we find a way to get some of these groups, you know, opportunities, albeit I'm sure they're all qualified. But no, that's not what DEI is. Again, we don't hire. We're not doing that. Our department is separate from everybody's department, if done properly. Now, some folks do tie it all together. Um, so the question, so the answer question is short answer is no. Um, am I concerned about being attacked? And are these things going to, you know, are, are there going to be issues? Of course. And I think that the, the fellowships uh, that have been attacked is, is a good uh, part of that. And I, I think there's been some reverse discrimination suits um, that also are in play. And I think, again, I'm not being a employment lawyer, but if I understand it correctly, um, even though some things are now race neutral, the outcome is such that it seems like one group is being favored over another. And I think that's where the argument comes in um, or some, somewhere along those lines. I'm sure you employee lawyers will know, but I know that there's been some cases, I think it's in the fifth circuit right now, that I believe that's sort of the argument. Yes, it's race neutral, but you know, how you've set it up, you know, it still is targeting underrepresented groups. You know what I mean? So, sure. um, but I, I never, I don't think DI will ever per se be illegal because it's already against the law to do 
anything like hire someone based on race, you know, religion, creed, you know, disability or whatever. Yeah, great answer. Um, okay, I'm going to jump back to, I'm going to maybe skip over the marketing and advertising piece just for a minute, because I want to get into training and then talk about any, um, I don't want to call them fails, just, you know, any times in which your organizations or you individually have encountered um, situations where you've tried something that hasn't worked well, because I think we all have faced that in our various roles. Um, but first, um, does anyone want to chime in on the question of training? There's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of ideas about whether training on DEI topics is actually useful or not. Um, and so I just want to get a sense of whether any of your organizations have implemented training that have actually been successful and what do you think made it successful or meaningful for the people who were involved? Um, and maybe I should have checked on this before to see if anyone wanted to address this question specifically, but I'll just uh -oh. trust you to unmute. Okay, it looks like Grace and then Kenneth, go ahead. So um, when we do our sexual harassment training every year, I always throw in um, an implicit bias training, even if it's just to prove to everyone that it exists and that we have that part of our customer service is to make sure that we listen to people and you can't listen if you have predisposed ideas. I mean, part of us being lawyers is actually like gathering the facts and trying to analyze the situation. And so that's how I, I pitch it. It's just good business if you ask me um, to say, hey, be careful when you're asking someone a question that you just assume, oh, they're poor, they don't have a house because that could be Howard Hughes sitting in your, in your um, lobby. Does that make sense? So you don't know the actual so I, I pitch it that way. And, and because I deal with so many foreign nationals, there's a lot of racism among countries that you don't even know about until you actually leave the country. And there's like history of wars between Peru and Chile that I didn't, you don't really know about until you actually visit Peru for a long period of time. So I'm constantly making my people be aware of their own internal um shortcomings and to make sure that they treat all of our clients with respect and each other with respect. And that's basically, you know, it's, it's built into our, my model and I do it for my yearly sexual harassment training. Um, but again, I just think that's being a good person guys. I mean, that's why when somebody says, is this ever going to be illegal? I'm like, uh, good business is never illegal. <laughs> and, you know, being a good person and being nice to people and trying to have a good place to work. I think someone made a comment that if you just, if you create an environment where people feel safe to talk about their needs, then you're going to have retention and good business. So um, I do do it every year, just so you know, and I remind them um, that it's necessary. So very good. Did you, have you ever had feedback, positive or negative on your training specifically? I had people say, oh, I never thought about whether or not they were from one region of Mexico versus another region of yeah. Mexico, but you're right in my, I'm a Mexican American. And I think those people are always drug dealers or those people are always dumb. And I'm here like, I never thought about that before. And I was like, yes. Yeah. So remember that just because we're all happen to be a Hispanic doesn't mean we're not racist too, guys. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of language in Spanish that's super not appropriate in American culture. Like we call people fatty and that's the kind of endearing thing. Like gordita, it means like, oh, little fatty girl. I'm like, hey, please don't call me gordita. It makes me mad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so there's and so there's things that I have to remind people that it may be okay in your culture. And we had this whole discussion about kissing in the workplace because mm -hmm. Latins really kiss. Like they kiss twice, they do a lot of touching. And I'm like, guys, I am so sorry but you may think it's okay, but it's not okay for this person. And if you don't do it, then they're not being included. So I actually told them not to do it. So, because I thought it was problematic and they were not super happy with me, mm -hmm. but now mm -hmm. I think they understand when someone's culture does one kiss versus two kisses versus is it a back tub? Is, I mean, it's just complicated. We as Americans are very much more straight laced than that. So sometimes you just have to adapt. And I said, doesn't mean you don't love each other and you guys can kiss in the parking lot, but please don't kiss inside of our offices. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if you employment lawyers again, tell me that's wrong. I just thought it was oh. the best call. I treated everyone the same. No kissing. <laughs> Who's ever said no kissing at your law firm? Yeah. I'm sure that that's a weird thing to say, but I've said it. <laughs> so. I love all these disclaimers about um, employment lawyers. <laughs> by the way. Anyway, uh, go ahead, Kenneth. Uh, yeah, I mean, so um, I, I've done a variety of, of, of uh, DI training, um, and generally, I've tried to do it as an education piece, um, so that everyone in the firm sort of is speaking the same language because what I found is that 
um, oftentimes when like RFPs need to be filled out um, or uh, particularly like when you're meeting with a client and I'm not around or someone that is more adverse and DI is not around, uh, I had partners basically say they feel uncomfortable, you know, sort of talking about it, right? So I've tried to use DEI training, um, uh, A, I've tried to do it myself to the extent possible um, because there's a lot of, um, uh, I don't want to say fraudsters, but there's a lot of, there's a big market for it now after 2020. I don't know if you guys are on LinkedIn, but I'm always getting bombarded with stuff. And then I'll have a conversation with people. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Um, so there's a lot of people out there that are trying to make money off it now. Um, so, but I try to do just, I, I've tried to do the basics on things like implicit bias. Um, and because that's really something that I think everyone needs to understand, particularly people who are hiring um, need to understand that we all have, you know, these in inherent biases and we need to recognize that we all have them. And therefore, when we are looking at the hiring process, you know, we don't want to, you know, have bias sort of step into, um, you know, our, our, our decisions and make us miss good candidates that could make our firms better and more inclusive. Um, but um, so I, I don't, I mean, I hope, knock on wood, that I've never had a failed uh, DEI training because I've always tried to tie it to something that someone can tangibly take out of the program. You know what I mean? I don't try to have touchy feely programs. I try to make it something that, okay, at the end of that we're done, you can come back to me and say, oh, okay, I learned this there. Now, how do I implement it and what I do on a daily basis? So that's, that's you know, um, where I think, you know, if you're going to do any training, there should be a tangible takeaway, not just come in and say, okay, what is diversity? Okay, this is diversity. Great. Now let's all go back to our offices. It should be something that, you know, that there's going to be a result at the end that someone can say, okay, now I'm back in my practice. I can go now talk to a client and say, I understand what implicit bias is. Uh, I, from, from a business case perspective, I understand that I shouldn't put, um, you know, Ken Sharperson on the RFP if I'm not going to let him do any of the work, right? Like all these, like something tangible they can learn about you know how to basically push forward our strategic diversity plan, and then that's kind of again how I try to to frame our training. So that's why I hope knock on wood, you know, it hasn't failed. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, we're sure we're a really small ahead. firm. I just wanted to say we're a really small firm, um, and we've only been around for um, almost four years. I guess I guess we've been around more than three years. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't had any DAI fails yet, but that's just because we're new. And so, you know, next time I'm on one of these panels, I will report back about our DAI fails. <laughs> <laughs> well, so maybe on that note, do any of the other panelists have other, and I mean, just programs that maybe weren't a good fit and you'd learned it from someone else, tried to implement it in your own, own workplace and it just didn't work or any experiences where you felt like, okay, this is not exactly right and we need to readjust. Well, I, well I, I'm sorry to step in, but I, what I can say oh is God. I actually wrote an article um, um, called Managing Risk, I think it was like Managing Risk Routing the DI Program, some of those lines, and I did research, and believe it or not, there is case law out there on diversity training gone wrong, and it's not Michael Scott's version in the office, I don't know if you've seen that episode, yeah. but um, but there's there's been instances where essentially a company was sued by a white male employee because the trainer, um, I forget the exact context of basically the trainer was trying to make this person feel just totally destroyed and totally guilty um, for anything that had been done by, you know, any, um, you know, majority group for like 100 years, something along those lines. And so he actually sued um, the company for, for doing that training. And it turned out like, I guess, in discovery, you know, obviously I read the case, but in discovery, what it turned out was that the trainer had no really training in anything. It was just sort of someone who just went out there and said, I can do this, right? Um, so I again, so just leaving when you think about the risks of bringing in someone, you really need to make sure you vet who the trainer is. And I would ask yeah. for uh, evaluations because what I can assure you now in 2023, um, I'm a member of the Association of Law Firm Diversity Professionals. And we have a listserv that says, hey, has anyone heard of you know Michael Smith like doing training? And trust me, the the clarity of which you know whether or not this trainer is going to be good to come to you, it's there because someone has hired sometimes a lot of these people and had either bad experience or a good experience. Okay. Um, so if you are going to bring in an outside source, um, just be very careful about, uh, A, what are they going to actually do training wise? Because again, you don't, because it's about inclusiveness, not exclusiveness, right? Um, so be very careful about, you know, who you bring in and how you vet them. Right. How about aside from training? Have you tried any efforts aside from training that just haven't been 
you know, they just, maybe it just like, they didn't go anywhere. Right. No one came to you and said like, this is not good, but it just like, was well, it not sure, sure, maybe. Well, I, I think, again, being here now and seeing the DI billable credit, and I'm able to obviously look to see what people are putting in there as from time a time perspective. And so I, I, I am going to have to be a little bit more clear on what, because we actually have a written policy for what counts. Um, and I can tell by, based on sort of how it's been utilized prior to my, me arriving um, that I have to be very clear on what is constitutes a DI billable credit. Um, and, and the way broadly it's sort of defined in our policy is that which is going to, you know, basically put um, uh, move our move the needle forward at our firm with our strategic diversity plan. So even though, for example, you might feel like you're doing some good, um, I don't know, volunteering for something or something charitable, that's not necessarily, at least from our perspective as a firm, moving the needle forward for our firm necessarily. Now, if you can tie it obviously back to maybe a pipeline program and something that you're, you know, doing something in that way. But just because you go, you know, build Habitat for Humanity, right, that's not necessarily, you know, a DEI billable credit. It might be more pro bono, quite frankly, depending on how you frame it. But um, my point, though, is that, um, you know, even if we, even though we have this DEI billable credit, you know, it's not like people are really using it. So I can't say it's necessarily a fail, but it's certainly, you know, it's there. And I know when I was billing hours, if I had 125 hours I could do to do something I love, I certainly would have maximized my use of that, you know what I mean? So I'm not sure it's quite a fail, but I do think it's, you need to, we're a work in progress with it. Yeah. And I think that last comment is exactly what I'm trying to get at is that it's all work in progress, right? No yep. matter where you are, no matter how much you love your workplace, it's a work in progress. And so that's, I hope the message that we can send. Um, we've got a few more minutes, like four minutes, it looks like. If anyone has questions, please put them in the chat um, and I'll watch for them. I'm going to maybe just raise one question that I didn't get to before while we're seeing if anyone raises questions here, but, um, and that is, you know, I think a lot of people and a lot of firms and organizations are doing really great things and we don't always hear about it. How do you send that message to the people that should know and not, you know, self-promoting, but you want to attract the right people. You want to attract the right clients and those kinds of things. And if you're really putting in the time and effort, you should, you know, at least, somehow be able to to publicize that. So what have you all done on that front? Anything to add there? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I tell my associates or the people that work with us to be authentic and to pick something they really love um, because no, you know, one can smell a fake faster than people in the community. So, right. I mean, I happen to love dogs and cats, so I will do anything with a pound. I'm not so much, I don't really care about planting trees. That's not how I'm going to spend my time. Right. So you have to do something that's authentic, that improves the world. And then if you do it, you really love it. And your passion shines through. And guess what? Every time I go and do something, I meet someone that's like, you should be my lawyer. Oh, I didn't know you did that. And that's what I tell them. I said, so go out and build your practice by doing things that you love because then people will sense your passion and they'll want to hire you. And so I always say being a do-gooder is kind of good for business, guys. It really is. Um, it diversifies your bottom line. It brings new clients. It, and plus it makes your life fun. And then you like your job better. So and I, that's, so we do everything we do is because I think it's fun, just so you know. And then I let my associates do what they think is fun. Um, I'm not going to micromanage their, their passions. Yeah. That's my two cents on how to build that community and growth. Okay. Uh, Sharice, did you have something? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to to, sorry about that. <clears throat> no, Izzy, do you have something? I was just going to say, this is a great plug for the Euclid certification program, right? I think this is part of, this is part of trying to do these improvements as being part of the conversation with entities that are already doing this work and can connect people who are making strides to improve inclusion is to, to jump in and be a part of that conversation with programs like Euclid. Yeah, great point. And um, Euclid's executive director, Caitlin Piper, put in um, a link for the certification just now, but earlier in the chat, she put in a link to ideas of different goals that firms have set for their certification, which I think is a really useful list to go through and say, oh, that might work for us though. That's not really a good fit, but kind of work through that process. Um, and I, I will say too, and, and full disclosure, I'm on the board of Youthly, so I'm completely biased, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, we've had firms come to us and say, like, we have this idea. Can you help us make it happen or help us know if it's a good idea? And I think that's also something that 
is showing your commitment to, you know, various audiences. So, um, Ken, did you have something else you want to add? Yeah, I would just close um, with one quick thing that I, I've heard recently, which is this cold concept of the DEI fatigue and, you know, whether or not, you know, people should still be fighting the good fight. And I think, you know, if you have a commitment and if you believe in this, because it's not going to be illegal if done right. And if you're a smaller shop and you have the, you know, ability to uh, to get a consultant, maybe you should bring in a consultant. But, um, you know, I, I just I always compare it to um, like a CFO, right? Is, is like firm leadership going to say, you know what, there's new laws out there. We can't keep track of the books. We're just going to get rid of the CFO. We're not going to do accounting anymore, right? We're, they're not going to do that. And same with marketing. And I think uh, DDI is the same way. If we know our clients think it's important, we have to now, as law firms, think, you know, uh, uh, catch up to basically corporations, right? Because they've been doing it for a good time. So, you know, just fight the good fight you know, do it right. And if you need help doing it right, there are, there are legitimate consultant, uh, consultants out there who can help you. And, and, and a lot of times they will work with you on pricing and things like that. Um, so I would just, that's how I would just leave this program is, you know, it, it makes a lot of good business sense. Um, and it's the right thing to do. So keep fighting a good fight. Uh, perfect conclusion. I'm not going to add anything more other than to say, um, thank you to our panelists, to Ken, Grace, Sharice, and Izzy. Um, I always love these conversations and this one has been great. So thank you to everyone else for being here and joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Melinda. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yep. Take care. Thank you, guys. It was fun. Nice to meet all you guys. Yeah, my class. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Melinda. Yeah. Good to see you all. Thanks, you, Clee. <laughs> Thanks, the bar. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Michelle and Lydia. Always appreciate it. Thank you. you.